You guys ready for it today? I always ask you a question along those lines because there's something about the way we think and operate that if we're challenged to, to answer a question, are we going to go for it? It just kind of puts us in that spot. We say, yep, or nope. But whatever you choose today is going to be awesome, but I know God's got a powerful word of transformation for you. So my challenge for you today is open your mind, open your heart, get ready to capture what God talks to you about in the next 30 or 40 minutes. Here's the promise. You're going to hear lots of words. I'm going to say a lot today. You know me, I preach on and on and on. There's lots of words. But the most important words you're going to hear may not be something that I say. It's probably going to be what God says to you while we're teaching and preaching. So as you're filling in the notes and as you're capturing your ideas and thoughts, be listening for what God says to you. Because if you'll capture what God talks to you about, write it down or take it in your phone, whatever you're uh, capturing those thoughts with, and then bring it back up into your weekly journey through uh, God's plan for your life this week. I promise you, if you apply what he talks to you about today, it will change your life. So if you missed the greeters on the way in, this is your last chance. Uh, slip your hand up. They're going to pass out the paper notes. If digital is your thing, go ahead and open up your phone. Uh, promise not to do Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, social media of any kind. Uh, do not watch sports teams or anything else. Don't watch the news. Just stay with the LifeLink app or fa uh, FaceTime. See, that's what happens when you try to get all fancy. Or YouTube, uh, version, not YouTube. If I see headbuds or earbuds going in or headphones on, I'll know you're checked out for sure. So stay with us. Anyway, bottom line is God's got something great, but you want to capture it. So let's do this today. We're wrapping up today our series that we've been on the last few weeks called Playlist. And the idea is that there is something about the way God designed who we are. He gave us our mind. He gave us our body. He said, I want you to worship me with all of your heart and soul and strength and mind. I want you to worship me with every part of who I created you to have and be. And part of that is with our mind. And God is really uh, powerfully working into this particular series the way that he brings real life transformation in our life. And that's what we've covered the first two Sundays, the, the first two Sundays of the series. So if you've missed part one or part two of this three-part series, you've missed a couple of big pieces that you'll need in order to make what we talk about today come into focus. So we always preach the Bible, and we preach like Jesus preached when he was on the planet. He actually talked about the things that everybody walked through in their normal everyday life, and he would take timeless truth and principles from heaven and God's timeless truth and wrap it into the context that they understood and said, here's how the kingdom of God works. And he would always use illustrations that was common to people. So he never tried to impress people. He tried to instruct and inform people and guide them with truth from God, from who he was. Does that make sense, everybody? So as we're going through this today, we'll do the same thing. We're going to take uh, the way God actually uh, reveals his truth in scripture bring it through examples we understand, and then let the Holy Spirit cause our minds to be fruitful so that we get what he's talking to us about. I think perhaps if Jesus was here on the planet today, he may say something along these lines because sports is a big deal in our culture that the NFL regular season starts 18 days from today. Now, he's already, he's already chosen his team. Now, God likes the Cowboys. For those of you that are wondering, that is his favorite team. But uh, I don't really care. Or the Eagles. He, he does like the Eagles a little bit from time to time. As, but he's not that fond of the Steelers. Just, I'm just trying to find where you're at, you guys. I'm just playing around. But the bottom line is, God uh, would Jesus may actually use something from the sporting world because... Everybody kind of gets it. We all have our kids in sports events and, or things along those lines. And so what I wanted to do was bring a couple of illustrations from that environment, from NFL that starts or here in just a few days, or uh, the NBA that starts here October 16th. So we've got, a, we've got some big starts that are coming. But what I want to do today is think with you about some of the things we love about watching sports. All right? Uh, so some of us enjoy watching whole games. For me, I can kind of take or leave a whole game. What I love, love, love is the post-game show. Because the post-game show, they don't put any boring stuff in there. It's always the highlights. You know what I'm talking about? 
So it's the, you know, it's the 50 yard pass and the wide receiver's got, you know, a toe kind of stuck there on the edge of this. He reaches out with two fingers and catches a hundred mile an hour football. And, and it's just amazing how that's like, oh my Lord, I love that. Or it's a guy that's shooting, you know, a, th- a three point shot at the end of the game and he, it's uh, nothing but nothing but net. And it's like, bam, I love that. And so we love the highlights. We love the highlights. At least I do. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that they put those highlights, uh, post-game shows together because that's what I like. Now, as much as we relate to liking those kinds of things, and we can apply that to some of the big things that happen in life where there's major breakthrough and God did a miracle and all those other things, and all those things are true and real, what I really want to focus on today is not the highlight reel. I don't want to talk about necessarily the post-game show. What I want to talk about is what is the foundation of all of that that makes it possible for those athletes to perform at that level. Because, see, nobody starts thinking, I want to win a Super Bowl. So I think I'm going to run on down uh, to Cardinal Stadium. I'm going to walk on and just play in the Super Bowl game and win. Nobody does that. The path to a championship, the path to uh, excellence, the path to high performance always starts years earlier with with something that's very unglamorous. It's called drills. Right? Right? And what's fascinating to me is some of the best coaches always start every new year when the, 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 the team gets back together, uh, the basketball coach will say, now listen, guys, I know you're an NBA superstar, but let me show you something. This is a basketball. This is how you dribble. Let's practice that. This is what a layup is. This is a free throw. Let's practice that for a while. Now, you might be thinking, well, hey, I'm a superstar. I already know all this. The best coaches will say, as if you've never done it before, we're going to practice dribbling. Why? Because it's practicing dribbling. It's practicing those layups. It's practicing those free throws. It's practicing the uninspiring things over and over and over against the drills that give you the foundation that when the chips fall, you're so trained that it's reflex. Your mind's not even there. So you've got a forward who comes in from the side and he's floating through the air and he's twisting and he's contorting like a pretzel and then reaches around under the basket through three, you know, three players and their legs and arms. And all of a sudden it goes up like that and the ball goes woo up in the air and whoosh, right through the basket. Like how did he do that? Because for like the last 25 years, he's been doing layups over and over and over. His, his, his brain just knows where that basket is. Why? Drill, drill, drill. Does that make sense? So nobody appreciates the drills. What we love is the post-game show. I love those big plays. So as we're working through uh, our series, this, uh, and to wrap this up, we're, I'm titling this particular sermon, The Winning Plays. Winning Plays. And so we always associate winning plays with the the, the Hail Mary in the end of the, end of the end zone or some big uh, post-game show play. But really the winning plays aren't those. They win games that way, but they are able to do that because they drill, 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 drill. So I want to tell you today, we're going to cover some things that are not brand new. I know you're shocked. You may be a little disappointed, but we're going to cover some things that are basic And the reason we're covering them is the basics are where the power really is. Here's why. You do need to know what you're doing when it comes to the word of God. But it's not what you know, it's what you do. You have to know it to do it, but the actual freedom is not simply in the knowing. The freedom, the breakthrough, the post-game highlight is in the doing. That makes sense? So as we're going through this today, I want you to know that we're doing this so that we win like athletes do what they do. They do that to win. So their motivation for drills is not the sake of the drill. They drill, 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 so they win. We're going to talk about basic, 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 basics so that we win. So what does it talk about to win? I want to draw some context out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, 30, uh, chapter 10, verse 31, the last part of that, God's talking to us through the new te- in the New Testament. He says this, whatever you do, 
I want you to do all of that for the glory of God. So whatever you do, what part of whatever is whatever? All of it. Right? When you say the word whatever, that's whatever. The way you sit there, do that for the glory of God. The way that you um, say hello to somebody, do that for the glory of God. The way that you pay your bills, do that for the glory of God. The way you respond to your wife, do that for the glory of God. The way you respond to your kids, do that for the glory of God. The way you pay your taxes, do that for the glory of God. The way you drive, do that for the glory of God. The way that you go to the grocery store, do that for the glory of God. In other words, in the back of your mind, God and your glory, I'm doing all this for that. I don't understand, Pastor Dave, what, how does that work? I'm glad you asked because we're going to drill into that today. And you're going to find out by running some of the basic drills, God's awareness and everything begins tied to some of these basics. And you'll find out how it connects. So I'm going to encourage you to really pay attention over the next few minutes. God's going to connect some dots for you. And it's going to be awesome how God uh, uh, brings ideas and concepts together because it comes right out of his word. And when we apply his word, we win his way. Now think about this. We choose our way through every day. Yes or no? We do. Life is a run-on series of choices and actions. You're choosing to stay seated and listen right now. What are you doing? It looks like you're static, but the choice, the reality is you're choosing to stay there and listen. You chose to come to church this morning. You chose to tune in wherever you're at. In other words, we choose, 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 choose. And we ultimately get the experience that goes with what we choose. So, here's what most people don't realize. Most people, when you look around, seem to make their choices and actions based on reactions or desires. In other words, somebody said something and it made me feel this way, so I said that back. Somebody showed me something, so I wanted that, so I went out and got that. And think about just for a moment, what is the basis of most of what we choose? Reactions to what we think, feel, or want. Why do we care about this? It's the way God made us. Most people don't realize they're stuck in cycles of addiction. They're stuck in cycles of defeat. They're stuck in cycles of uh, discouragement simply because they won't do what God said to do about the situation that they're in. In other words, they're not paying attention to God. They're paying attention to what they want or what they think or what they feel. So God's going to say, here's the way out of that. So this morning, what I want to do is get us started and, and work through the issue of what are, the, what are the winning plays that we need to make sure we have going in our life so that as God works through his word and his leadership in our life, our lives begin to align with who, who he is and what he's doing in a way that leads us out of wherever we're stuck, wherever we're bogged down, wherever the relationship's a mess, wherever the finances are a mess, whatever the issues are. And so, again, borrowing on some of the context we've already covered in the first two sessions, let me go through this. At a high level, just like an athlete decides, I'm going to drill, 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 drill so I can win, win is the priority. So based on that priority, I'm going to actually drill, 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 drill so that I can win. We're going to look at what does God say on this side so that we obey, 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 obey. Drill, 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 so that we what? What's this one? Well, in essence, it's going to be our win, but here's how he says it in his word. The first thing that is our top thing is I've got to put, I have to live Christ first. Hey, everybody, listen, look at me in a sec, for just a second. In order to win in the kingdom of God, you have to live for him. You have to live for Christ first. In other words, when you think of something, you look back over your shoulder at the word of God and say, is that right? Okay, yes. All right, when I'm I'm thinking of a thought and I'm compelled to say something because somebody really upset me, I I look over at the word of God and say, is that right? Okay, God, how would would you guide me in this? Jesus, what's the word? Okay, that guides the way I say my response. Does that make sense? 
So we have to live Christ first. In other words, we've got to make sure that we're living for God. So how do we live a Christ first life? First thing we're going to do is set my priorities on God. I have to set my priority. My priority has to be God first. God first. Not me first, not lifestyle first, but God first. My priorities. And this is where it seems a little bit backwards, but God says this, in, and Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to you. Now, what's interesting in the context of that particular verse is this. Jesus was talking to people answering lifestyle issues. And he was saying, listen, every, all of you are living pretty much the way we live today. If you take Instagram and social media and Starbucks out of our equation, everybody then will still pretty much live in the same way we're living now. Basically this, who's popular? What am I going to eat? Where are we going to entertain ourselves? How do we make sure we're on top? Does that make sense? He was basically saying, that's how you're living. You're pursuing things you think will actually make you happy. And I want you to know they will never make you happy. But if you'll do this, if you'll prioritize me first, seek first the kingdom of God and rightness with him, then he says, here's what will happen. I'll add everything that you think you want, but it'll come the right way and it'll fit in the right spot in your life and it'll actually fulfill you. You just can't seek them. You seek me and my way first. I'll add everything else. So go back to the Old Testament. What do we see there? Proverbs 3, verse 6 in the Living Bible says this. In everything you do, put God, what? First. In everything you do, put God first. And he will, what? Direct you and what? Crown your efforts with what? Success. Bam! I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Do we want to win? Do we want to succeed? Do we want to have effective, successful lives? Yes, God says, here's how you do it. Put me first in everything you do, then I'm going to direct you and I'll crown you with success. In other words, not success as the world sees it, although you get all that stuff too, but I'm going to give you what actually fulfills you to the deepest parts of who you are. Your life will be filled with success eternal success. In other words, real success, not just temporary, fad success that evaporates like the sun when it goes down. It's the idea that I'm going to fill you with fulfillment, success. I'll crown you with success. What's he saying? If you seek me first, put me first in everything you do, then I'm going to guide you and what you do will become effective. What does that mean? Think about the different parts of your life. My marriage, my finances, my health, my relationships, raising my kids, uh, doing life in freedom. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, bottom line, put me first. Consult me first. Don't just do what you think. Don't just do what the people around you are doing. Don't just do what you see on social media. Don't, you, don't just copy. In fact, that's what Romans 12, 2 says. And I don't mean to re-preach a couple of sermons ago, but he says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let me transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. In other words, set yourself on prioritizing me first and I'll guide you. So, if when is the motivation to drill, 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 what we're saying is we have to prioritize God and his kingdom first in my life. If I prioritize God and his kingdom first, then everything else just flows into alignment with that. So what are those everything else's? Let me make this practical. How do we practically put God's first, God first? How do we prioritize God? Let me break it down. Remember I was using the NBA, the basketball picture? Like this is a basketball and here's how you dribble. I want to bring it down to that level. How do we put God first so that there's no confusion? These are simple ways to make sure that we prioritize God, putting him first. All right, now, I've stalled as long as I can. Can you tell I'm stalling? Because this is the point where everybody's like, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, we, ju we just covered that about six months ago, Pastor Dave. Oh, we, I already know that. Tell me something new. I need, some, I need a whiz bang here. I need, I need something powerful. And God's going to say, ready? Here's how you dribble. 
So just because you may have heard this before, remember, it's not what you know, it's what you do. It's not what you know, it's what you do. So let's see if you're doing this. First thing, I'm going to break my life into the parts and pieces of my life that I manage, I steward, that I make choices on. And we're going to look at all these areas, and it'll become very clear in a second how we put God's for, God first. So one area of, of life that I make my choices on is my time. Write that down, my time. I handle choices that affect time in my life. I'm the one that chooses it largely. So how do I prioritize God in my time? Easiest way to do it is give God the first part of my week. Write that down. Give God the first part of my week. What does that mean? I take what God says to do in the first part of the week, which is worship. See that pattern in scripture? And I actually move to the place of worship. Congratulations, you're here. You're prioritizing the kingdom of God first in your time by giving him the first part of your week. And you're actually aligned with that. Now here's what he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And there's a typo there. It says one dash, but it's really Hebrews 10, 25. In the contemporary English version says this, some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship. But we must not do that. All right, everybody, he said some people started the pattern of worship, but they got busy, they got distracted. They let things get in the way and they, it got them out of the habit of worship. But we must not do that, why? Because this is a basketball and here's how you dribble. Prioritizing worship. We should keep encouraging each other, especially since you know the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. So what do I do? Write this down, I worship on the first day of my week. I worship on the first day of my week. Right now, in the culture of the rhythm of life, Link, how we're working this, we actually start our week on Sunday with worship. There may be a day in our future we actually have a Saturday night service. I would consider, I would actually consider you shifting the way you think of that, like you start your week by going to Saturday service, if that was that. You may think, well, isn't that wrapping up a day? Well, let me give you a picture on that, okay, for those of you that are very detail-oriented. You could start your day when you wake up in the morning with breakfast and a cup of coffee, or you could start your day on the night before by saying, I'm going to go to bed, I'm going to go to sleep, concentrating on the things of God, and I'm going to get a head start on my day by tagging the night before with that. Does that make sense? So in case those of you are wondering about that, if we ever do Saturday, don't go all legalistic on me. Let's live this out together. What are we saying? Prioritize God, first day of the week. Then the next thing I'm going to have to do is I've got to give God the first part of my day. I have to give God the first part of my day. <clears throat> We see this, <clears throat> excuse me, picture in Joshua chapter one, verse eight. It says this, study the book of instruction continually. That's the word of God. Meditate, it on, it, meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything in it. Only then will you what? Prosper and succeed in what? All you do. What's he saying? Here's the pattern I want you to have. When your eyes open in the morning, if you're going to meditate on the word every day, that means you got to start. If you have to meditate on the, on the word all day, that means when your eyes open and you start your morning, you put it in front of you, and that begins to set the tone of your day. That makes sense? So in doing that, what you're doing is you meet God at the beginning of your day, and the power of that encounter with him actually steers and flavors the rest of how that day goes. And I promise you, if you'll adopt that pattern, you'll notice the things he, he talks to you about in Scripture are the things that you begin to experience in life. What's he doing? He's meeting you at the front of your day in the power of his word and by the work of the Holy Spirit and said, I'm going to walk you through the day. I'm going to give you a heads up on some things to pay attention for, and I'll be there when you need to make big decisions. Why? Because you started with me, you kept your mind on me, all the way through the day. So give me the first day of the week. Give me the first part of every day. What are we doing in that? We're giving God the priority of our time. If you're not sure how to do this, write this down. We use an, an acronym around here called SOAP, S-O-A-P. And you can find this particular SOAP outline on our website, lifelinkchurch.com. The bottom line is it's a scriptural reading plan that takes into account about a 15-minute chunk of your morning where you read scripture, you write observations that God talks to you about, you write the application of what it means to, to do what he talked to you about, then you pray about it together, and then that's how you set your day with uh, renewing your mind before you get started in your morning. All right? If, you're, if you have questions about that, uh, refer to the, the soap guide at lifelinkchurch.com. So if I'm going to prioritize God, the first thing I have to realize, I've got to give him my time. The next thing is I've got to prioritize him with my Talents. Everyone say talents. 
talents. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God, what? Prepared where? In advance for us to do. Let's read this out loud together. Ready? Read. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So here's what I'll, the picture. God prepared some works for you to accomplish. He built you to accomplish those works. And he basically said, I've equipped you with the tools or the gifts, talents that you need in order to accomplish that. And when you and I do those together, you are fulfilled. You're fulfilling part of my divine purpose. So let me give you a practical picture. This is a whole sermon. I've got about 15 seconds to say it. Every person fits in the family of God in a local church setting somewhere. I believe that's God's divine design. In that local church family, you have something he created in that family for you to do. We call that your ministry in the church. There's something he gifted you with, people, uh, people skills, administrative gifts, uh, creative stuff, music, technology, whatever it is, there's something he gave you in order to serve that family like the members of your household. Make sense? So every person has a ministry in the church and a mission in the world. There's something God created you to do to serve in your church and make a difference in your world. And he says, I created you, I gave you talents to do both. Talents to do both. And he said, your life is in balance if you're serving in my kingdom, both in the church and the, my mission in your world. So you're thinking, all right, Pastor Dave, that being the case, how do I do that? Let me give you some practical applications uh, as we begin to wrap this sermon up. At Lifelink Church, we are committed to give people practical steps in order to fulfill what God's called them to do. And at Lifelink Church, the way we give people a glimpse of who God created them to be is something called Growth Track. It's a class we, op we offer during the 1130 service every Sunday, every first, second, third, fourth, and fifth Sunday. We offer what we call growth track class during this service. And the whole point of that class is to give you the ability to meet Jesus, discover what it means to be a part of his family, discover who he created you to be, engage with those gifts, and then find out what on fifth Sundays, what's, what's the Holy Spirit all about. So that growth track class is designed to give you everything you need to fulfill this. Once you discover that, we're going to connect you with something called Dream Team, which is how you serve the ministry of the church, and that's for every member at Lifelink Church. So when it comes down to it, if I'm going to prioritize God, practically speaking, I give him my, I prioritize him in my time. We talk about that by giving him the first day of the week, first part of my day. In my talents, I make sure I use the gifts he's given me, however old or young I am, by serving in the church and my mission in the world, I do that. Then what's next? The next part is my treasure. Write that down. My treasure, the finances that God gives me. Just like God works powerfully in the way we choose to steward time, the way we choose to steward our gifts, he works powerfully in us the way we steward our finances. So when it comes to this, one of the things God is very clear on is the way we participate with him, returning his tithe and then giving as he directs. And it's no different than how God says, I want you to manage the time I've put in your hands by prioritizing me first in your time, me first in your talents. Same thing with our finances. Here's how it works. Malachi chapter three, verse six and seven and through 10 says this, I, the Lord, do not change. Then he says, I want you to return to me and then I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Then you ask, how are we to return? And and, he, and God asks in verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. And then you said, well, how are we robbing you? And he says this, in tithes and offerings. And because of that, you're actually living under a curse. The whole nation because you're robbing me. The, and then he says in verse 10, here's how you fix it. I want you to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the picture of the local church in our current setting. That there may be food in my house. And then he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that you don't have room enough to receive it. So practically speaking, how do we, how do we facilitate this function? By giving you a place to, write this down, return God's tithe in the spiritual house or the local church that he plants you in. 
So if you're a member at LifeLink Church, this is where you'd return God's tithe. And when we worship, we return the tithe and say, God, how much would you like for me to give with it as an offering? If you're visiting from another church, please be faithful to return your tithe when you get back home to your church that God planted you in. Why? Because you're aligning with his kingdom. You're aligning with his ways. You're aligning with his word when you steward his, your time, your talents, and your treasure his way. What are you doing? I'm prioritizing you in all these big parts of my life. Does that make sense, you guys? So people sometimes wonder, how do I prioritize God? You just break it down. First part of every day, first day of every week, make sure you're prioritizing with your talents by serving in the house, reaching out to your mission in the world. When it comes to your finances, return God's tithe at your local church, ask him what to give. If it's at church, give at church. And then if he says, no, I want you to give your, return your tithe and give your offering somewhere else, that's fine too. What's he, what are you doing? I'm listening to the word of God and I'm letting him prioritize my, my life in those different areas. Now, where the rubber meets the road in life is this, the last one. We prioritize him in doing or living my life together with other Christ followers. Living my life together with other Christ followers. Living my life together with other Christ followers. I know you've heard lots of words. I've been coming at you now for about 36 minutes. We're almost done. I'm going to ask you to reset for a second because I need to connect with you on this. A lot of times, this is where people really miss out on the strength of the family of God. Because they say, hey, I go to church somewhat regularly. I give in the offering. I don't feel connected. And the reason people don't ever, the reason when I hear somebody say, I don't feel connected, here's what I know that I know. They're not intentionally connecting with life groups. They're not intentionally connecting in the dream team. They're not, they're not intentionally connecting in with an open mind and open heart. And I got to tell you this. It's in the, the power of Christ followers doing life together is where the strength really is when it comes to being a part of the body of Christ. We see a picture of the strength together here when we're worshiping together. But when life gets really hard, it isn't what happens on Sunday morning. It's when the life group leader and some of your life group members show up in the driveway of your house when life gets really hard and you're trying to figure out what do I do about the next day. That's where all the relationships really come together. And if you don't do that, you're missing out on the strength. The care and the heart of LifeLink Church is not Sunday morning, and it's not my pastoral prowess in how big of a, how great of a pastor I am. The heart of LifeLink Church is specifically framed and forged in relationships that develop in small groups. Please, please, please connect in small groups. Why? That's where the power of life change really happens day in and day out. It's in the context of small groups. And I'm making a point of that because the Bible gives us this picture. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other person can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better because a triple braided cord is not easily broken. What's he saying? There is an exponential strength available to you when you substantively and relationally connect to other Christ followers going, that, going God's way in your lane and in your season. I promise you, if you'll do that, you'll find there's strength available to you that isn't available by simply attending church. You need to worship together with the church family. You got to connect with believers doing life together. That's where it really does get strong. Now, you probably noticed a bunch of tables out in the lobby on the way in. It's because we're about to start a new semester at LifeLink. Three times a year, we start new rounds of small groups. Why? Because we are a church of small groups. We don't just have a few small groups. We are a church that does life together in groups. So all the groups in the menu, Every spot on the dream team, even the Bible college, school of ministry, all those places are places where people intentionally connect, develop relationships, and grow through those seasons together. And God says, in that context, I'm going to fill you with strength. Let me land the sermon today by talking to you about being intentional, not just reactional. Being intentional, not just reactional. Let me circle back around to almost where I started. Where I started the message today was on the issue that most people simply react their way through life. I think I want to do that. I think I want to do that. I think I want to do that. 
never realizing that little tiny choices made every day coalesce into the stream that you call life and take you where you're going. Take you where you're going. There's a picture of something that we see in Joshua chapter 14, verse, uh, it's actually, it's 24, I, I typoed that. It's Joshua 24, 15, it says this. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods of your, fa- gods of your fathers uh, that served, they, they served while they were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites or in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will what? As for me and my house, we will. As for me and my house, we, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Say it with me. We will serve the Lord. He's saying, listen, you're going to choose what you're going to choose. Everybody chooses what they choose. He said, if serving God doesn't seem right to you, and he used the phrase evil, but he said, if that doesn't make sense, if you choose not to do that, then choose whoever you're gonna choose. But I guarantee you this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's he doing? I'm making a decision ahead of time. I'm saying to me and everybody else, this is the priority before life happens. I've already decided how I'm gonna respond. I'm not gonna just react. Why? Because if I leave it to the moment, I'll want the wrong thing. I'll react the wrong way. I'll say the wrong thing. So I'm going to decide ahead of time what God wants me to do. Wow. I'm going to look at his word and say, oh, then that's what it means. Then the issue is when you're offended, what do you do? Matthew 18. I always run that play. I don't gossip. I don't get people on my side. I don't draw people to myself. If I'm offended at something, I go right to that person and say, let's work this out. Does that make sense? If I'm talking to somebody and they're dishonorable to me, then I'm going to honor them back. If they're spitefully using me, I'm going to pray for them. I'm always going to bless people. Why? I'm never going to curse people. Why? Because I run that drill all the time. Why? Because that's what Jesus said. That's how you live. And I run it over and over and over. And people say, why are you so gracious? Why are you so that way? People are using you. I don't care. I'm just blessing people, blessing people, blessing people. Listen, I'm the first one to say I'm sorry. You know why? Because I want unity in the spirit and the presence of God so much, I really don't care who's right or wrong. It's just, I'm sorry. Why? I don't want to be fractured with people. Why? Because in the, in the power, in the presence of humility can come unity. And where unity is there, then the favor and blessings of God is. And I want him in my marriage. I want him in my household. I want him in my finances. I want him in my friendships. I want him in our church. I want him in our ministries. So I don't care who's right or wrong. Let's just get it right together. Why? Because I cherish this. Why is it so important? Because it's the drill. Do I want to? No, I'd rather be right. I'd rather look smart. But what I really want is God's favor. So I don't care how I look. Man, Pastor Dave, you sure let your wife do a lot around here. Man, Pastor you sure let Pastor Dave drive pretty hard. Man, this, man, that. You know why we defer to each other? Because we've learned that God really meant what he said, submit yourselves one to another. So in our marriage, we really do that. Am I the head? Yes, I am. That means I'm on the bottom line responsibility. But that means I'm really listening hard to what she's saying. Why? Because I run that drill all the time. I never force my way around anything in our marriage. Why? Because I understand the power of what God said. Here's the drill. Live it out. When you're offended, here's how you react. When you're tempted, here's where. So that's why I'm saying be intentional, not reactional. Be intentional, not reactional. Because every time, if we wait to the moment to decide how we're going to respond, we will invariably respond incorrectly. Ask me how I know that. Because the other day I was at Albertsons. (laughs) And I was walking down the road, a row of sweets, the bakery section. I walked there after I realized there was no powdered sugar donuts. You know, the white donuts, the hostess white donuts, they they were out of them. So I was walking through the rest of the store and I noticed as I walked through the bakery, there's this big box of powdered donut holes. So I bought that big old box of powdered donut holes. And I thought to myself, I'll just have a few. And I did. Then I had a few more. 
Then I had a few more. The next day later, I had a few more. I was only eating like two or three at a time, but it was about a week later, I looked like I'd plowed through that half of that box. And it dawned on me something. And listen carefully. Maybe you came to the service only for this one thing. It didn't matter to the cells in my body if I ate all those donut holes at once or if I ate them over a period of a week. My body counted every calorie, no matter when I ate them. So I looked at half of those donuts, the donut holes, and I thought, if I don't get rid of this box, I'll eat every one of them. And it doesn't matter if it takes two weeks, every calorie be on this body. So I did what every sane thinking person would do. I grabbed that box, I, did, I ran, I did a slam dunk in the trash can with half a box of donut holes. I mean, there must have been 40 of them left. It was just awesome. <laughs> then I put nasty stuff on top of them so I wouldn't be tempted to go back and dig it out. Come on, you know, you know that's how it works in your house, right? Why? Because I decided I'm getting rid of the box right now or I know what I'll do. I'll eat them. That's the picture of what, what we're seeing here in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. He says, listen, choose whatever you're going to choose. Here's what I'm going to say. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What does that say? I'm going to run. I'm going to set the play, the winning plays of righteousness up. And I'm going to run those plays again and again and again and again. Day after day, conversation after conversation, moment by moment, I'll run the plays again and again and again. Why? Because there'll be one moment at some point in my life that my toes are barely hanging on the infield of that uh, end zone and I'm reaching out to catch a 100 mile an hour football or 40 or whatever miles an hour that is. And with two fingers, I'll haul that big play in. Why? Because for week after week after week, day after day after day, I trained, I trained, I trained. And without even thinking about it, with a reflex, I just reached out and grabbed what looked impossible. And people will say, my God, how'd you do that? And I'll say, God was faithful. Why? Because I learned to live his way. So when it comes to the winning plays, there will be moments that you do get some of those post-game highlight clips. But those will only be there if day after day, moment after moment, conversation after conversation, we do what the winning plays are set up with. Drill, 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 drill. What does that do? I gotta prioritize the kingdom of God. How do I do it? I gotta put him first. How do I do it? Put him first in the things I choose on. Time, talent, treasure, relationships. Put him first, 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 first. And when he's first, then the Bible says, listen, if you'll do that, I will actually guide your life and crown you with success. If you, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, if you put me in my kingdom first and seek my righteousness, what will happen? Everything else you want and need is coming to you in a way that fits and fulfills who have created you to be. You're going to love. It's perfect that way. So when it comes down to the, the playlist, the winning plays are all based on the priorities of who God is and how he wants us to live, even if it doesn't make sense to us. We just say, God, you're God. I am not. Because I prioritize you, I'll run your plays. I will shift the priorities of my life around to make sure I'm running your place. Why? Because 10 years from now, three years from now, two months from now, I'm going to need to be able to reach out and catch a winning football. Does that make sense? There'll be a curveball that comes in my life. I need to be able to reach out and grab the principle that's going to guide me through that and save my marriage. I'm going to need to be able to reach out and grab the principle that's going to actually guide that conversation and save my job or save my kid or save my whatever it is or whatever the fill in the blank is. It comes when we prioritize God first and we run those drills. To play, 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 play. Train, 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 train. Obedience, 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 obedience. Why? Because God uses that to shift and shape who we are on the inside. And all of a sudden, our lives are aligned with him and his kingdom, and favor is on our lives. Guys, that's how you win. Did y'all get something out of that this morning? Oh, hey, wait a second. I asked you that question before I gave you the fill-ins. I saw you. It's like, wait, 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 don't land. There's three fill-ins. Let me give you these three fill-ins. This is what I was talking about just a moment ago. Micro choices matter. Micro choices matter. All those donut holes, every choice counts. Every choice counts. It all coalesces into the experience you have. Micro choices matter. Just because they're small choices doesn't mean they don't count. 
Look here, I know I'm gonna take about 30 seconds to explain this to you. A donut hole is not gonna kill my pancreas. A donut hole won't kill it. It won't shut it down. It, a donut hole won't give me diabetes. Got it? A donut hole won't. The fact that I've chosen to allow myself to eat donut holes is what will shut my pancreas down. That makes sense? So the micro choice, we're deceived often into thinking, oh, that won't hurt, that won't hurt. One more time, one more this, one, that won't hurt. The issue isn't that donut hole. The issue is the fact that I'm postured on the inside to eat donut holes. So because of that, whenever I want a donut hole, I eat a donut hole. Y'all follow? So that's what I'm saying. The micro choice itself may not actually hurt you that one moment. But if you'll start shifting the micro choices around to actually be obedience, those micro choices build you into God's blessing, not away into destruction. So when it comes down to Joshua chapter 24, the choice is mine. What's he saying? You get to choose. The choice is yours. You get to choose. The reality is, the last part is, you get what you choose. So micro choices matter. I get to choose, the choice is mine, but I get what I choose. So God says, Here, you know what the winning play is? Prioritize me. Run the micro choices that I'm showing you so that they coalesce into a flow of obedience and favor in your life. Now, how was that? We good? All right, let's give the Lord praise today. All right, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your faithfulness. What a great series. God, life changes imminent around the corner as we begin to apply what you've been talking to us about. We love you. We thank you. I'm asking, God, you would give every person courage in this room who needs to make a decision to say yes to you. Father, there are some of us in this room today when we consider the way we've been choosing how we live, that it's clear to us you have not been what we prioritize. We're just doing what we think or what we want or how we feel. You call that sin and said there's only one way out of that pit and the, the, the devastating destruction called hell at the end of this life if we, don't, if we don't repent and turn your way. And that is we've got to submit our heart to you, receive the gift of salvation that comes by your lordship, what you did for us. God, touch our hearts today. Let us have the courage to say yes to you in a meaningful way in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you that simple question. Are you living Jesus first? Are you living Christ first? Do the thoughts, attitudes, actions, and, and choices of your life reflect Christ first? Or do you know deep inside that you need to make Jesus first by repenting for your sin, turning your life over to his leadership, and following him as your savior? If that's you, in just a moment, this whole congregation is gonna be praying what we call a life change prayer. I'd like to ask that every one of you have the courage to act, that are in that point of decision to say yes to Jesus today and make the decision to follow him. Ready? Let's all pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, come on out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me enough to give me the truth of your word. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins. I'm asking you to forgive me for every sin I've ever committed against you. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new, I pray. Come into my heart, the middle of my life, and lead me forward as my God and Savior, because I've decided to follow you as my only God from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, church, let's put our hands together and celebrate. I love it. Thank you for watching the LifeLink Church video podcast. It is our prayer that you heard a word from God today. If you have a story to share about how God is working in your life, then let us know and send us an email at mystory at